you please turn to Proverbs chapter 31? Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 10. If you'd hold your place there and be prepared to go to verse 30. And then also Proverbs 18 verse 22. And then finally, Proverbs 24 and verse 27. So to begin, Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 10. An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. And then if you turn to verse 30. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Let's go back to Proverbs 18 and verse 22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And then finally, Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 27. Prepare your work outside, get everything ready for yourself in the field, and after that, build your house. And thus far the reading of God's holy word. Well, we have been taking a a number of weeks uh, sidestepping our study through the book of Ezra, doing sort of a mini-series on the process of getting married. And the reason why we did that, if you remember, is that we came to that part in the history that's recorded for us in the book of Ezra, where Ezra is informed that the people of Judah and Jerusalem, the people of God, had been giving their daughters in marriage to the unbelieving nations around them, and their sons were taking wives from the unbelieving families around them. And the result of that, of course, was a spiritual declension among the people of God. And so we are taking this time to look at some biblical principles respecting the process of getting married. Now, we're not saying that the biblical principles are all of the exact applications, right? You have a biblical principle, and then that can be applied... And sometimes the application looks a little bit different depending on culture or history in the world and so on. And the same thing takes place here. We drew an analogy between the, with the principle of family worship. That's a biblical principle. Uh, families should have a time of family worship. Now, how that exactly looks in each family will vary from family to family. Right? The particular way in which they do that. But the principle is there. Well, we have been looking at principles of biblical courtship. The process of getting married. The Bible teaches us a great deal about the marriage relationship. And it also teaches us principles concerning the process of getting married. Now, we live in a very unbiblical culture. And so, none of these principles are really being uh, followed. But... Should God so bring revival and there's a great thirst for his word and the people of our land say, what does the Bible teach? Then we expect that there will be a resurgence in these principles of biblical courtship. Now, two weeks ago, we introduced the topic by defining the main distinguishing mark of biblical courtship in contrast to the common practice of our day, which developed in the 1920s, and for lack of a better word, uh, is referred to as uh, casual dating or recreational dating or just the process of dating uh, without um, any real concern for uh, marriage. If it happens to work out that dating couples marry, that's wonderful. But the distinguishing mark between biblical courtship principles and what we would call uh, recreational dating And that is the involvement of the parents in the process. The Bible clearly teaches us that parents play a significant role in the process of seeing their children marry well. The Bible teaches that children are to marry with 
the consent of their parents. And that's not merely a rubber stamp, that is their approval, that's their consent. In fact, last week as we looked at the authority and care of fathers over their daughters, we saw that the Bible teaches that the father is the one who gives final permission to his daughter to marry a particular young man. And if a father has biblical reasons for not approving of the particular man who is seeking to have her hand, he may refuse. He has that authority. And this is taught in several places in the Bible. We looked at that, and it's implied by the phrase, uh, giving your daughter in marriage. Right? Daughters are given in marriage by their fathers. A Christian father's responsibility toward his daughter is to make sure that he gives her into the hand of a mature, godly, diligent, and faithful Christian man in marriage. And he is to give his daughter to this man as a pure virgin with godly character. And that's why he needs to exercise oversight and supervision in the process of courtship. And so to do that, he's going to have to be involved in getting to know any young man who seeks his permission to get to know his daughter. And from the start, it is wise for the father to have the young man to get to know his daughter in his own home, in the family context. That's where the word courtship comes from, right? That's the family room or the kitchen, the court of the house of the father. And the later term came to be calling, right? When a young man was interested in a girl, it was said that he is calling upon her. That means he's coming over to her father's house and in the context of the family, the living room, he is getting to know the daughter. Always under the supervision of parents, if there is any time when they are going out in a certain uh, location, always under uh, the watchful eye of a chaperone. Um, this is what we looked at last week, and this is all entailed or um, encapsulated in that expression, a father gives his daughter in marriage. Now this evening, I'd like for us to look at the responsibility of parents with respect to their sons when it comes to the process of getting married. We've mentioned several times over the past three weeks that the scriptures say, that a man takes a wife and daughters are given in marriage. The only exception is widows and uh, divorced women, those who are innocently, uh, the innocent party in a divorce, uh, they're not given in marriage. They may marry as they choose. You remember from the first marriage, when God brought the woman to the man, it says in Genesis 2, 24, therefore, or the New American Standard says, for this reason, for this reason, that is marriage, for this reason, marriage, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Sons leave home, the home of their family, for the reason of marriage. This is the ordinary pattern for men. Now, obviously, by God's gift or circumstance, or providence, God may have a man or call a man to being single. But the ordinary pattern is that uh, sons leave their parents' home and take a wife. And in doing so, they're leaving father and mother. That's to say, they're going to live independent of father and mother as he joins with a wife. Christian parents are to have a concern for the marriage of their sons. And Christian parents are to train up a child in the way he should go. And that includes training his sons from the time that they're babies to take a godly Christian woman to be his wife. That's a goal of Christian parents when it comes to their sons, to teach them to prepare for taking a godly Christian woman to be his wife. Christian's parents, Christian parents should never remove themselves from giving advice or guidance when it comes to their son preparing 
for marriage or choosing a particular woman to be his wife. That can be a temptation to do. You know, just that's his decision. You know, he's, he's got to choose. I'm not going to get involved. Well, the Bible says that parents ought to be involved, ought to be encouraged. And sons ought to listen to the advice and counsel of Christian parents. If pr- Christian parents are devoted to studying the word and want to teach what God's word says to their children, then Christian children should listen to that advice and take heed to it. The Proverbs teach us this over and over again. You remember Abraham's concern for his children? Uh, I'm sorry, for Isaac, his son. Abraham's concern for Isaac, his son, who he would marry. You remember Abraham said to his servant, he said, Swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, but you will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son there. And so you clearly see there Abraham's concern, his interest in the particular woman that his son Isaac would marry. Isaac must marry a Hebrew woman. His father Abraham lays this out as a direction for his son. Now, you might ask, oh, is this arranged marriages? Why did Abraham have the servant go and here you take this wife from... The reason for that, in particular with Isaac, it's very specific with Isaac. Isaac didn't leave because God told Isaac not to leave the promised land. You know, the principal would have held Isaac if he had not been restricted to remain in the promised land, then Isaac would have been directed to go to Padanaram and to take a Hebrew bride from among his kindred as well. Again, when it comes to Jacob blessing, uh, being blessed by Isaac. In Genesis 28, 1, it says, Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him, You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Okay, so you can see that a Christian father is to have an interest and concern for who his son marries. A concern of a Christian parent when it comes to who their son chooses to marry. Not only do they have this concern, but they are to verbally express a concern if they were to have a negative concern and to give direction and counsel. What happens if the son of Christian parents is making the wrong choice? What if they are making the wrong choice? Do they say anything about it? Do they bite their lip? That, again, is a temptation, right? If I get involved in this and if I say to my son, you should not pursue this relationship with this unbelieving girl, I might lose my son. That might be the end. They might just say, I'm not having anything to do with you. And then they're going to go off and they're going to have kids and I will never see my grandchildren and so on, so on. So maybe I should just not say anything. Is that what, they should, be, what should be done? Well, I don't think the Bible would direct us to say nothing. In Judges 14, we read earlier, we read about Samson pursuing marriage with a Philistine woman. And that's something that he should not have done. He should not have done this. And when he tells his parents that he wants this Philistine woman for his wife, Samson's mother and father say to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people? that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? You see how they get involved? And there's a, this, uh, the indication here is that there's a lengthy discussion and debate going on because this is their mother and father speaking. And then we read next that Samson comes back to the father and says, no, I want her because she's right in my eyes. Now, let's just pause a moment and remember Samson was a believer. He is in the list of heroes of the faith in Hebrews 11. He was a man of faith, and in fact, he was born under supernatural circumstances. He had godly parents. He was also a man 
who was raised under a Nazarite vow to be wholly dedicated to the Lord, but we read that he was also a man who often showed disregard for God's law and the vow that he was under. And we see that this is part of that mixed bag of Samson, right? His weakness. He's a true believer with remaining sin. We all can identify with this. And there's, here's a particular weakness. And he's not heeding the biblical counsel of his parents. Now we learn, of course, that in the whole account of Samson, that God is providentially at work in his going and taking this wife from the Philistines. We know that. But from the revealed will of God's point of view, that is from the perspective of what God would have us to do, he was rejecting what God would teach. And we see there, though, that the Christian parents were involved in saying, this is not right, you should not be doing this. That's the main point. Parents are to guide and direct their sons to take the right kind of wife. And remember, when we think about our work as Christians in this world, the mission of the church, what is the mission of the church? The Great Commission, right? To make converts? No, to make disciples. And to teach them everything that the Lord Jesus commands, that they would walk in the way of the Lord. So... We as Christians in the church are to be about the work of not just making converts and people who are going to go to heaven. We are about the work of making civilization, Christian civilization. That's part of our work. And that's why these principles need to be understood and applied. Now then, let's think about this biblical expression, uh, sons take a wife, or a man takes a wife. To take a wife requires effort. Right? The sluggard buries his bowl in the dish and he doesn't even take it out. Right? If you, if you want to receive and take something, you have to have the effort. And to have this effort requires preparation. Have you ever uh, moved a heavy piece of furniture with someone, like a couch or something? You're on one end, the other person's on the other end. And then they just start moving it right, without you being ready. And, and then you're like, whoa, and uh, one needs to be prepared. One needs to be ready to take on a heavy responsibility. And when a man takes a wife, he's taking to himself a tremendous responsibility. And so he needs to be ready. He needs to be prepared. We speak of uh, sons leaving as leaving the nest, right? Well, eagles don't leave the nest until their feathers are developed and they're able to fly. And once they can fly, then they're able to leave the nest because then they can hunt for themselves and they can build their own nest. So there needs to be a preparing that takes place. To take a wife is to take on the responsibilities of headship over a family. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7.33, with respect to men who desire to be married... And he's saying there, a married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. That's not a negative, evil thing. That is a fact. That's part of the duty of being a husband, is being anxious about pleasing his wife, caring for her, providing for her, nurturing her as a loving head. That's a tremendous responsibility. And so parents should teach their, ch their sons to be prepared to take a wife, to be prepared for it, before they start the process of going to, to look for a wife and get a wife. Well, what does that mean? Well, when is a man ready to take a wife? When is a son prepared to take a wife? How will he know? Is it come with a certain age? You know... You're 23 years old now. You should be ready to take a wife. The Bible doesn't say anything about a particular number. There are examples of 17, 18-year-old men taking a wife. I think there's one example of a king who was 14, maybe, when, he, when you calculate how old he was when he had a son, that he may have been 14 years of old. 
Uh, Proverbs speaks about rejoicing in the wife of one's youth. But of course, we also have examples of older men taking a wife. 40 to 75 years old. Jacob was 70 to 80 years old when he married Rachel. Okay? So it's not necessarily a number, but a spiritual maturity and a material capability to provide for a wife. Being an adult, in spiritual terms, being a provider in material uh, concerns. And until a son has become spiritually responsible and materially capable, he's really not ready to take a wife. And so wisdom would have him wait and be prepared first. These are the two main responsibilities of a husband, to provide a spiritual house and a material house to provide for his wife. And so this is the general principle. A man is ready to take a wife when he can be the spiritual and material provider for a wife. Now, if Christian parents understood this, it may be that a complete cultural shift would result. Because for many years now, parents have been focusing on preparing their sons to do some career or some work, right? I want my son, when he grows up, to be a hockey player. And so all my energy is going to be in developing his ability to be a hockey player. Or I want my son to be a lawyer or a teacher or a doctor. And so this is what I'm going to do so that when he grows up, this is what he's going to become. You know, and as little kids, you know, you might have been asked when you were little, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be? And uh, we always think in terms of occupation. I want to be a fireman. I want to be a policeman. I want to be, uh, but no, I want to be a husband. And I want to be a father. And that marriage is the reason for leaving father and mother and forming a new household. And so the focus, if the focus was on preparing sons for marriage, there might be a whole cultural shift. Rather than preparing them to become some occupation, they might focus on preparing them just to have the means to take care of a wife. Having them directly go into trades and labors or, or pursuing things where they actually can uh, work up that provision rather than spending a lot of time perhaps even getting into debt for education and then later working it through. Now again, we're where we are in history and so a lot of these things have to be worked out. But the imp important principle, the principle is first things first. First things first. We read this in Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 27. Prepare your work outside Get everything ready for yourself in the field. After that, build your house. Prepare your work outside. Get everything ready for yourself in the field. And after that, build your house. See, the wise saying is not, go take a wife, build your house, and after that, prepare your work in the field where you'll be able to then get an income. No, it's... Become a provider, and then you're ready to take a wife. In other words, before you take a wife, before you begin your own family, your own household, prepare your work outside. Get everything ready. Young men need to be ready for marriage before they seek to start the process of taking a wife. This is a reason. This is another reason why uh, young men and boys dating girls uh, is so wrong because they're not prepared for marriage they're in no position for it and so the emotional relationship that they are beginning to tie with young women uh, has no end in it in marriage it's just going to break apart and so it's an inappropriate thing uh, for Christian young men to do. So preparation for marriage is to come before pursuing marriage. And that means then that he must be spiritually ready. He must be spiritually mature. 
because he's going to be the spiritual head of his house. He's going to be the spiritual head of his wife and potential children. And he needs to be a man who loves God, who loves God's word, because he's going to be a spiritual provider. This means he ought to understand the Bible and sound doctrine. Parents, teach your young children catechism. When they're really young, you don't need to have them understand the catechism. Just have them memorize the catechism. Just have them memorize it so it's in their heart. When they get into their teenage years, then they can start to explore the meaning of all that they've memorized. But they need to understand the teaching of the Bible. And a son is not ready for marriage until he is mature as a Christian in that he is a man who has a self-governed devotion to the Lord. A self-governed devotion to the Lord. In other words, he doesn't go through the spiritual motions because he's under his father and mother's roof. He's ready to marry if he's self-governed in his devotion to the, ro- to the Lord. You know, it's interesting. In Second Chronicles 24, verses 1 and 2, uh, we read about... I better turn that up. Second Chronicles 24... 2 Chronicles 24 and verses 1 and 2. Joash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebiah of Beersheba. And Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. We read that after Jehoiada the priest died... Joash abandons the Lord. He walks away. So he was only doing right while he was being governed by his uh, governor. And a young man is ready to take a wife when he is self, has a self-governed devotion to the Lord. Joshua 24, verse 15, you know the verse very well. Joshua says, but as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. And notice what he says there. As for me, me personally, and my house, we will serve the Lord. Me, I will serve the Lord because I have a self-governing devotion to the Lord. That's my discipline. I know the Lord. I love the Lord. I serve the Lord. So as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so think about a, a, a young man who is thinking about marriage, is he ready? Well, is he spiritually mature? Is he spiritually mature? Does he have a self-governed devotion to the Lord? What is the pattern of his behavior? Does he tithe to the church? Does he understand the meaning of marriage? What it's for? Is he marrying just for himself and his pleasure? Or is he thinking about the broad uh, picture of marriage? to bring glory to God. I heard someone mention, I don't know if anyone here mentioned it to me, so if if you did, then you can let me know that. But there was one man who was talking about a young man who he heard was interested in his daughter, and so what he planned to do was to go to the church of this young man who's interested in his daughter and sit right in front of him in the pew at church. And do you know why? Because he wanted to see how loud he sings in church. Right? A man who has a self-governed devotion to God and loves the Lord's mature will sing loudly in church and praise God. He needs to be uh, ready for that spiritual work. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 and 35... As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's shameful for a woman to speak in church. And so there you have it. You see that a a man who's going to take a wife is taking on this responsibility now. If his wife has a question of something that is heard at church, 
He needs to be able to answer these questions. And so these are some of the ways that a young man is to prepare for marriage and ways in which a young man and parents can know whether or not a young man is ready for marriage. Are they spiritually prepared? Well, secondly, he needs to be prepared to take on the responsibilities of being a material provider and protector for his wife. You remember last week we looked at Numbers chapter 30 about which speaks about vows, uh, the vows of daughters who are living in the house of their father and then vows of wives who live in their husband's house and that is mentioned in both cases in Numbers 30. Uh, daughters who are living in the house of her father and then wives who are living in the house of their husband. See, the husband provides the house. The father provides the house. That shows that he is the, the provider of these things. We clearly see that daughters live under the roof of their fathers. This is the ordinary duty of a father to provide a home, food, clothing, protection for his daughter. And then when a son takes a wife, that becomes his responsibility to provide for his wife. Now, again, in some circumstances, it becomes impossible. And I believe that in many ways, we are living under God's judgment in our nation and in the Western nations. We are reaping what we have sown, right? We've abandoned the word of God and we're seeing how that is manifesting itself in many ways. And one of the ways that it's manifesting itself is that in our society and nation now, by and large, a single income household is very difficult and very rare. It's often that both husband and wife have to work in order to provide for the household. That it can't be that just the husband goes out and earns enough money in order to provide for a whole household. And, you know, the feminist movement, uh, which was a movement to say uh, equal rights, equal opportunities, um, equal lifestyle for women as for men, equal pay for men, right? Raise the wages of, of women to equal men. That's not what happened. What happened is the wages of men were lowered. That a single income became split between two. And um, so we're kind of right now presently feeling the sting of not being in an environment where the economy allows in most cases, in many cases, for a husband to be the single provider of a home. Now sometimes it's the case that uh, even in Christian homes, both are working not because it's impossible to do otherwise but because there's just a desire to live at a higher standard and perhaps it may be best to rethink that if a Christian couple is in that situation is it better to have a bigger house and more things or is it better that I stay at home and be the governor of the family of the home of the home while the husband is the provider. Young men, biblical principle, ought to be able to provide for a wife, to take a wife. That's what was behind the bride price, okay, in the Bible. When you read about the bride price, and please understand that if you look up bride price and dowry on the internet today, you're going to get many different current cultural practices of bride price and dowry. You'll also find a bunch said about ancient Near East bride price and dowry. And what we need to do is understand the biblical bride price and dowry that's in the law of Moses. And that bride price was a young man earning enough money to give to the father to have it returned in order that they would be able to start off and have a home together. That's what it was. So you see Jacob 
worked seven years for the bride price, right? And you think about doing whatever, uh, you know, uh, career or work, seven years of labor of that, and how much that income, the average income, I don't know what the average income is in Waterloo right now, but add that up, seven years of the average income of Waterloo, how much money do you have at the end of that? Does anybody have any idea? I didn't even think about that. Would it be about $700,000 or so? I don't know. But if you think about that, you know, $700,000, here's a bride price. And then a father says, okay, I know that now you can get a house and you can provide for my daughter. Um, Exodus 21.10 has this uh, very point in mind as well. Uh, I won't look that up. You can look that up later. It speaks of if a man takes a second wife, he's not to deprive her of her provision, her food, her clothing, and her marital needs. And that shows, again, the duty of a husband is to be the provider. And this is the wisdom of God. It's wise for a young man to work and to prepare for marriage in terms of becoming materially capable in the place able to provide for a wife. Again, we're in a very upside down world right now, right? We don't even have real money anymore, okay? So it's very hard to do this. I realize that most things is financed, most things are rented, most things, that's where we are and that's okay. But the idea is that you're able to provide, you're able to provide a home. And it's much more, it's uh, much less difficult for a, um, a young man to be prepared and once he's ready and he says okay I've got all this in order I know where there's a place to live I have the income to do this I have this and this and this now I'm ready to seek a wife and to take a wife and that that can be all discussed with the father of this young woman when he meets her it's much easier to do that than to Go find a wife, then all of a sudden, and then uh, I, now I need to get myself able to take care of her. Doesn't mean it's impossible. Jacob is an example of that, but it, it just is uh, a, a wise thing to do. So parents, train up your sons to this. Now I want to briefly, just very briefly, move on and ask, well, once a son is prepared, once a man is ready, what kind of wife should he take? What should we look for? How will he know? Well, Christian mothers ought to be an example of the kind of wife that a son should look for. You know, Christian sons should be able to look at their mothers and say, this is the kind of mother that I would like to have. When I look at my mother and the way that she conducts herself in her home, the way that she's raised us, the way that she uh, works in the church and so on, this is the kind of wife that I would like to take. So Christian mothers are to be the first example. And that example is given for us in Proverbs 31, 10, and 11. An excellent wife, who can find? She's, more, she's far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her. Again, Proverbs 18, 22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Now that is saying he who finds an excellent wife finds a good thing. You know, there is the quarrelsome wife who's like a constant dripping, right? An ill-tempered wife. Uh, that's not necessarily a good thing uh, to obtain in the Lord's providence. But an excellent wife. And you notice there that expression, to find, right? Who can find an excellent wife, right? He who finds an excellent wife. So young men, sons, have to look for an excellent wife, to look for an excellent wife. It takes exploration to look for an excellent wife because it's not just something that you can see on the surface, right? There is external beauty. And a young man and a man who's seeking to take a wife should not focus his attention on just the external beauty. Now, this is all that our culture emphasizes because we live in a sexually immoral and adulterous generation. Extramarital sex and pornography emphasize the physical 
and that has a tendency then to create uh, fantasies in the mind, unspiritual fantasies. And if a Christian young man is not guarding his heart, not keeping himself pure, focusing on these externals, then he may develop Amnon eyes. Amnon eyes. You remember Amnon, a horrible story that took place. One of David's sons, Amnon, in 2 Timothy 3, 13, 1. He was an ungodly man, and he focused it only on external beauty. And he didn't really know Tamar. He never really understood who she was. He just saw her external beauty, and he was infatuated by her. And he had to have her, just physically had to have her. And he developed, it seems, in his mind, this fantasy that somehow she would be like him. If I could get her near me, then we could just have this physical relationship. And when he finally did get her near him, he discovered she's a godly woman. She actually has biblical standards. She wants marriage. She's calling this a horrible thing. And when he violates her, he turns into hating her. It's a, hor- it's a sad thing because Tamar was a beautiful woman in every sense of the word. She would have made a wonderful wife. But Amnon's eyes was only focused on the external. Only o- focused on the external. Samson had the same problem. She seems right in my eyes. Beauty and attraction can distort the truth. And if a young man focuses only on external appearance, then he creates within his mind something that's not a reality. And so to find an excellent wife, you need to go looking for the heart of an excellent wife, for her soul, her character, who she really is. What is her commitment to the Lord? Is she interested in knowing Scripture? What is her commitment to worship in the church? How does she relate to her father? Does she respect her father? Does she submit to her father? Does she love children? Does she see children as a blessing, God's gift? What kind of mother will she make? Is she more interested in a career rather than raising children, managing a household? Does she share the same biblical convictions? And a young man who has biblical convictions ought to seek a wife who shares those biblical convictions. Is she selfish or does she serve other people? The Bible doesn't leave young men in the dark about what an excellent wife is and that kind of wife that they should seek. And uh, so... I often give counsel to young men who are interested in seeking a wife when they're ready and prepared to make a list and write it down on a piece of paper. Here's what I'm looking for. And be specific in that list and make sure that that list has biblical characteristics and qualities. Because when you see the girl, if you don't have that list, suddenly whatever your list was is going to just vanish. You're going to just be caught up oftentimes in just the external, but seeking a godly wife and her character. That is most important. So prepare and then seek the right wife. Well, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you give to us teaching wise principles on how we go about giving our daughters in marriage and how our sons should prepare and then seek to take a wife. And Lord, we also acknowledge that it is your providence over all of these things that uh, in the end results in receiving a blessing from your hand in terms of who we marry. And we thank you, O Lord, that you are so good to us, that you have blessed us, even in our own congregation with so many wonderful marriages, with so many wonderful Christian men and Christian women whom you have brought together in marriage. We pray for those who desire marriage, that you would be pleased to be preparing the one whom you would have for them, and that you would, in your time, reveal that, and that you would do this as your great blessing to them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's-